Good morning. Uh, a pleasure and honor, you know, to have you here on Frames. Did did I catch you before or after your your workout? Well, it, it, it's funny. My my uh, my lower back is actually giving me a day off, <laughs> but but uh, I still will do a little qigong for sure. Okay. But my normal uh, big yoga class uh, is going to be put off for just a bit. And, you know, I'm getting ready. I'm leaving uh, tomorrow for Japan. We're actually uh, in 36 hours. And so uh, I'm going to ease into it, carrying a lot of stuff. But, yeah, you caught – well, you, I'm always going to be caught between something. I mean, that's Okay. No, I, I was just, you know, um, I mean, looking at the amount of projects, you know, and, and jobs and uh, – and travels. I mean, you you have to stay fit. That's for sure. Yeah? Oh, so for sure. And and uh, I find qigong, you know, which is sort of a variation of tai chi, but you don't turn around so much, uh, is really healthy. And you can do it uh, anywhere. Uh, you know, if you're in China, you can go out and join people in a park if you want to get up at five a.m. Uh, okay. But uh, no, it's a, you, you have to. Uh, you know, in some cases. You know, when I was in uh, Ukraine uh, uh, during a war, it could it, it could mean the difference between life and death. I, I was not in any, this particular time any circumstances like that. But just, you know, North Korea carrying buckets of water up to fill a bathtub so you can have water, you know, in northeastern um, North Korea. Um, uh, yeah, you have to stay in shape is, 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 is part of it. For sure, hundred mm. percent. We gotta. Um, I, I mean, I think uh, people have to have a holistic ap- approach to uh, to everything, and and uh, that that's one of them. So there's a a long answer to a short question. <laughs> no, you know, I was you know before before recording it now with you, I was once more you know going through your portfolios and 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 projects, and uh, I was kind of trying to put a finger once again, you know, on uh, on the definition of a photographer, which uh, you know, Mark Edward Harris is, it's kind of you are running several different kind of projects, uh, very often in parallel. Uh, tell me about your photography, like the fundamental uh, drive, which you would say connects all those. All those that, 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 that is really insightful because that's really uh, me, and I'm unusual. Uh, I would, if I were to equate. My approach to a to a underrated but amazing uh, French photographer, I would say Jean Loup Cieff. Where, where and, and Jean Loup uh, and I, I, I had him in my first book, which was about photographers, and we were talking about that. He never allowed himself to be cubbyholed into um this or or that. And and in the United States, more than in Europe, you tend to be oh, you're a product photographer, you're a wildlife mm-hmm. photographer, you're a music photographer. I think in Europe it's a little bit uh, looser, um, but uh, I would say definitely I come from a humanistic uh, approach. Uh, it, it, my latest book uh, on orangutans is a bit of an aberration, but it came about uh, in one sense because we're such a, a connection. You know, we, we share ninety six point four percent of the same DNA with orangutans. Uh, and I found, you know, when I started, I was doing a travel assignment in Indiana at this, uh, at this, uh, but it was more on Indianapolis, but at this orangutan center, I did some portraits, very unusual portraits, you know, where I used a flash to overwhelm the ambient light. And uh, people kept reacting to it and it won a bunch of awards. And so I expanded that out. And then the people at uh, the Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation in Switzerland saw it in a magazine said, well, would you do a, you know, pro bono for us in Borneo, which I did, which then led to book. So, so if, when people see that, they think, oh, you know, Mark's a wildlife photographer, but then they get confused because all of a sudden they see the way the Japanese bath and it's black and white, hot springs, more fine art. Then they see North Korea, which is color, you know, more reportage. Uh, I, I definitely would say the connecting factor uh, is a humanistic approach. And if I can say in sort of a weird way, uh, even a, a humanistic approach photographing animals, because, you know, the, but mm-hmm. I mean, recall, 
when it comes to orangutans, you know, we're one of we're just one of five great apes, so we're really in the same family. But but no matter what it is, I think I do have a bit of a, a Japanese uh, sort of uh, feeling toward life. Uh, that, that that you know, and and there's life in everything, and you should have a respect for everything. Yeah, I mean, whether it's a tree or or even more of an uh, inanimate object mm-hmm. like a car, just it's just um, it's just my approach. But yeah, definitely a humanistic approach. Which of course, you know, people like uh, Edward Duba, you know, uh, you know, a lot of people who shot for reality had that uh, approach. I think Salgado. You can definitely say has a humanistic uh, approach. Um, so, he, yeah, basically, you know, by by visiting all those different locations, and and you visit and you choose really, yeah, extremely interesting locations. Sometimes not always the safest locations. You know, it's kind of is your like this undergoing uh, underlying, you know, aim is to kind of portray the place where we are living. You know. Uh, show it through your photographs, show people what's happening and what we can, you know, do about it and kind of connecting all those dots. It's, is it something, something like that? Yeah. And, and that's, and then that's, yeah. And getting back to your early question, which I, I didn't really answer completely. Um, it, yeah, it, you know, I don't wait around for assignments to do something. In other words, it's, it, you know, I, I definitely take and love getting assignments, but often it's, it's, it's something that just hits me. And I want to pursue it. And, uh, you know, my bachelor's is in history. My master's is a special major creating documentary work, combining photography and history. And so almost all my stories are, are history driven in, in one sense. I mean, even if you said the, or cultural driven, like the way the Japanese bath, the Japanese hot spring tradition, as you know, is such a huge part of the makeup, the fabric of, of the people. Uh, North Korea, I was always fascinated by the interactions of, um, you know, countries, uh, you know, why are they good? Why are they bad? You, uh, you know, just, just, you know, evil and whatever. And, 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 you know, the rhetoric. And then all of a sudden, say with Japan, you know, we were at war until 1945 and now we're great friends. It would be nice to skip the war part and just become great friends. And so, mm-hmm. but, but that's not the case. I mean, you see that. In fact, William Durant, when uh, Will and Ariel Durant, two of the greatest historians of our time, uh, their final book was called "Lessons of History," and it's it it it's their summation of this their many years of study and all the books they did, and they came to the conclusion that that humans' uh, natural tendency toward solving conflict through through war, and so at, at one time. Uh, in, in the beginning, that inclination was, you know, with sticks and stones. But now we have nuclear weapons, and we're we're, we're seeing what's going on around the world and the th- and the threats. Um, and, and so, but, but you see that that this ties into my interest in history. And so, obviously, you know, Ukraine. Uh, there, I focused on animal rescues, people that were putting themselves in, in line of fire to rescue animals. Uh, mm-hmm. in, in North Korea, it's just to see what's daily life there. Uh, Iran, once again, daily life. Uh, the tsunami uh, coverage in Japan that I did, which I have, you know, my exhibition. That's why I'm heading to Japan on, uh, you know, right away, uh, is to be there for my uh, tsunami exhibition. Uh, is because Japan has given so much to me in terms of, you know, covering the Olympics there, uh, the Japanese bath, just my love of the culture. But you know, you have to cover both sides, you know, and and to give a fuller picture but uh, and so I just decided to get over there as soon as I could after it happened and then I sold the the story later uh, but but the the point was not to do it as a money-making thing it just Mm -hmm. felt right to do and so but I'm very fortunate that Vanity Fair picked it up five years later uh, Civil Beat uh, Olaf Hermes uh, who has a fund about uh, uh saving the beaches and stuff. He, he did something with it for his foundation. Uh, yeah, and so it's really just sort of what motivates me and feels right. But I think a common thread will also be an historical uh, aspect to it. And, and and how did we get to a certain place? 
you know, no, it's never so, in a vacuum. Mm. So, you know, touching on all those uh, uh, kinds of projects and stories. So how, how have you been predominantly making your living as a photographer? Was it, was it books? Was it projects? Was it working with foundations? Uh, how does a photographer like, like, like yourself uh, survive? <laughs> my, my ex-wife kept asking me the same question. <laughs> but, but no, actually, she's, 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 she's an angel, and I'm going to see her next week. She'll be at the opening. She's Japanese, and she's back in. She actually went back for work, but um, we, we see each other every time I go there. Uh, and she actually helped me produce the, the Japanese bath book. Uh, the Japanese bath book actually d has done unbelievably well. We're in a third edition, and a lot of people have bought prints for that. So that actually has been a source of income. Uh, I, I, I think door. I, I think books more often uh, are, are used uh, for opening doors. Uh, the the North Korea book, if it was strictly, or if it were strictly just on, was it worth? funding myself going back and forth, back and forth. Not so sure. Definitely Japanese bath book was. Uh, but North Korea uh, also led to a big assignment uh, w with the, the great writer Pico Iyer, and I illustrated it for Vanity Fair, and that, that paid well. And it's been picked up many, many times. Uh, photos are always selling through Getty Images, though the stock photography world is definitely uh, taking it down to live in terms of economics. Uh, but I've also sold, you know, huge prints from North Korea, um, and 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 lots and lots of uh, you know magazine features, and so mm -hmm. I also teach workshops and do assignments. So I and I used to shoot more advertising photography, but but and then I went to Clio for advertising, but um, that's never that was never that close to my heart. I I, I definitely didn't mind it, but didn't pursue it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really being flexible enough to uh, pursue different avenues within the photography world. You know, when one door closes, another opens. And so, you know, I had so many workshops scheduled uh, and then COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And that was tough because I saw one after another and we postponed, we postponed. And then, you know, we had a couple of years. Oh, oh. Those are, are coming back in, in a big way. In fact, after Japan... I have a quick assignment in Taiwan, and then I'll continue on to India with my friend Sandro Miller, who's, an, for, for those of your viewers who don't know him, they should look him up. He's an, um, one of the greatest portrait photographers of our time and did this incredible series with John Malkovich where he recreated famous photographs that inspired him. Mm -hmm. And so, so and, and the workshops uh, bring in very good income. So I would say it's a, having a lot of sources and also mm -hmm. living... Uh, very uh, being aware that when I get big, big projects like a Coca Cola around the world project to document their their humanitarian efforts around the world, to not say, "Wow, I just got all this money and then spend it," you know. In other words, just always be balanced and and be aware that that this is always going to be the way oh, free yeah. is. And speaking speaking of balance, so. You know, when I opened the uh, the way of the Japanese bath book, you know, for the first time, and it happened in my case, I, I have the book. It was probably maybe twelve years ago. I don't know. Uh, you know, it kind of screams fine art photography, right? Yeah, I mean, that's that's how we react, right? It's black and white, beautiful images, you know, wonderfully printed, you know, and and laid out book, and uh, but it's still, in a way documentary work yeah. right because yeah so do you consider and then then we look at north korea uh color work um definitely documenting the, the place but would you classify this where, where do you see yourself again you know it's about the balance that's, is that's that, yeah that's the thing i definitely uh the way the japanese bath which um you you have the first edition the third one is this one and has um, you know the Japanese clip just like you know I've got it on my sweater. Oh yeah, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> just by accident, but uh, and, and Scott Rivera, I have to give a shout out to him because he's my designer. And he's amazing, uh, and okay. he's done a, a, a several of my books. Um, 
that is definitely a, more of a fine art. I, if we could call it a fine art documentary approach, uh, some of the, the people in the photos, uh, everything's real, uh, but uh, some of them are my friends. I mean, it's not easy to shoot nudes at a, a, at a hot spring. I know you've been to hot springs. Uh, you know, often I get permission uh, from the place uh, and, and we go and I have friends. And so they're real people. Uh, and, and we're not staging things other, and, and I don't, of course, in North Korea, my documentary work is never staged, uh, but I will say we, we would like to photograph and, and the people will often say, well, why don't you shoot? We, we wash or not, we wash, we clean the place. We, we close at, at, at 10 a.m. And then, uh, we clean it until, uh, 11. Could you please come right at 10 45 or mm -hmm. right at 10 a.m. and shoot? And so then I'll, I'll just tell my friend, you know, just please do what you normally do. Yeah. And so, so one could say, well, you know, you, you uh, in a sense that that could be staged, but I'm not saying do this or do that. Uh, mm -hmm. because, uh you know, my friends are Japanese <laughs> and you know how to take a bath better than <laughs> exactly. Right. Now, that doesn't sound quite <laughs> right. Yeah. Whereas, whereas North Korea, you said nothing was staged. I was under the impression that in North Korea, everything is staged. Oh, well said. <laughs> no, nuts. Well said. Well, well said. Uh, well, I mean, here's the thing. Uh, you know, Pyongyang is definitely a showcase city for sure. And they're trying to, when you have your guides taking you around, um, they hate the word minders, but, but, which is often used, but the guides, you're always with somebody. Uh, and and so it's it's I would say it's 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 orchestrated in a sense that they want to take you to where they want you to go, but but it's impossible when you travel all over the country, you know, which I have, you know, ten times. The whole country is not that together, or in any place is not that it can be that orchestrated. The problem is often you pass something and you see this amazing shot, and you say, "Please stop the bus, please stop the car." I'm going to shoot this. And they go, oh, no, 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 no. You know, they look at the watch and they say, we got to get to the next statue. Okay. You know? oh, is, it, is it the fact that it's really not allowed in, in between? Or you, you would be possibly allowed to, to shoot those places, those extra places, or just they are just really on, you know, on a... If, if it were a positive to them photo, then yes. In other words, if it's, yeah. a, if it's a statue of Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-un, you know, uh, you know yeah. or King Jong, King Jong uh, Kim Jong-il, then you could, then yes, of course they have time for that. Uh, I mean, a, a really good case in point is the, uh, the my my photograph of the uh, traffic officer in Pyongyang, and uh, that photo just worked out really well. I had that that was during the New York Philharmonic's historic uh, concert when they were invited to, in two thousand eight to come the concert, and I kept begging, uh, could you please uh, stop? Uh, on the way to the concert mm. hall, because like just every, we would pass every day this traffic officer out there in midwinter in a heavy coat, beautiful coat actually, uh, and they and once again they would say, oh no no no, we got to get to you know mm. rehearsal hall, yeah yeah, okay. and, and, and so I decided I said I've got to get this shot, and so uh, they were playing an American in Paris, uh, and that's about seventeen minutes long I think or so, and I thought well. If I can uh, get out the back door of the rehearsal hall, walk the you know half mile or so down to where the traffic officer was, get the photo and get back in before the music ends, you know I can get the shot because I, yeah. I just that that's one thing about me. Even though I'm very easygoing in a certain way, I do have a myopic sense. Once I, it's, I'm like a magnet to a photo. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. don't, don't, yeah, I don't want to be. Were you, were you also involved in actually photographing the you know the the concert or the orchestra? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I, I wouldn't have been there otherwise. In other words, it's very hard. Ah, oh, okay. We are traveling with them? Yeah. Well, in other words, what happened is is th this was my second or third trip into North Korea. But I this time I went in as press. And uh, and so we had more leeway than normal. Uh, they still, you know, were trying to restrict us, you know, uh, but but we had more leeway. Uh, and so I, I documented and we had, we had several exhibitions with the New York Philharmonic and also at the Korea Society in New York uh, from resulting work and also magazine, uh, coverage. And also those photos went out through Getty Images. Uh, but, uh, 
I put my camera equipment in a very heavy overcoat because it was really freezing. January in North Korea is really cold. Went out the back door as soon as they started, uh, uh, an American in Paris, and uh, hiked down very quickly to that corner, uh, went out into the middle of the street. I had a, uh, a Nikon speed light on in my left hand to, because it was, it was starting to get harsh shadows under here. But I, I, I conceived what I wanted to do. And then I shot the photo with a little quarter CTO on the on the mm -hmm. flash to give it a better balance. Because when I use flash, I, I just want to help have it uh, help the the photograph, but never scream like any Leibowitz loves. Mm -hmm. to, yeah, this is a, a, a lit shot. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I don't want that feel. I want it to just help an ambient light shot you know get rid of yeah, the raccoon yeah. eyes as we call it mm -hmm. and so uh i got that shot put the camera quickly back inside she was not too thrilled at that time that was 2008 so i didn't speak that much korean i knew a lot more later it's a good thing i didn't understand what she was saying i don't think <laughs> super thrilled yeah. about me being out there as any as any traffic officer would be in any part of the world so it wasn't just a north korea thing so i got back to the concert hall just as the music was ending i was you know i had the music in my i really did have the music playing in my head to sort of mm -hmm. tie the, the, how far I, how long i could be out there and how long it would take to get back well so you know the piece very well then i do i, do. I used to play piano <laughs> more at oh, really you know, like rhapsody in blue which is another gershwin favorite and so I, I i i can't sing in tune but i can play you know but mm -hmm. that's a whole other story right. but okay yeah, so I got back in, and then a uh, one of the uh, minders, is, which uh, I'll, I'll call them what, what they prefer as guides, said, did you have a nice walk? <laughs> so they knew, uh, and they let me slide. And they let, and, in other okay, words, yeah, I, I was about to ask, you know, it sounded kind of, you know, that it's not as restricted as I thought. because Well, well no, you know, you know I, I, I would, was not allowed to do that. Okay. Uh, but, but you were not risking your life or something like that, right? Well, uh, because this was, the, uh, I, I did feel an added sense of security that I was part of the, 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 the press team. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. They they wanted this to really be a positive thing, uh, and and it was a very positive thing. And so to to give me a hard time about that uh, would not have been in anybody's interest. Uh, to do that yeah. same exact thing. Uh, at another time, like to sneak out of a hotel, go get a get a shot and come back, mm -hmm. that could be a uh, very serious issue. Okay, uh, it's not a life and death situation, but it's a possible imprisonment yeah. at times, yeah. especially yeah. as an American. Uh, yeah. But well, I, I'm happy you are here. We can talk, you know. So everything went yeah. fine. Yeah, it, yeah. It did. <laughs> Let's have a look at a couple of your of your photographs. I prepared five photographs from different projects. You know, just you know the ones that you know uh, apparently you know caught my eye in a special way. If Appreciate you could you know share a couple of words on each of them uh, uh, with with the viewers, would be amazing. Mm -hmm. Let me just open the uh, and I wonder also what you how you will react to my choices. Ah. Uh, let's see. Okay, we're starting in North Korea. Oh, that's interesting. That's, that's yeah. That that's um, uh, an environmental portrait, which is a, a, a big part. And when I teach workshops, I always say, really learn how to do an environmental portrait. And, and first, we start with the definition of what is an environmental portrait, uh, which is, you know, basically a, a photograph of a person or persons in an environment that relates to them. But it's still a portrait. It's not just a documentary shot of them going about their business, you know, driving mm -hmm. a bus and you're shooting from the side or whatever. It is still a portrait. And so this was the bus driver uh, of a bus that supposedly Kim Il Sung was on. And so, uh, and then uh, the woman collecting tickets. And so I asked if they would stand in front, you know, of the bus so I could do an environmental portrait of them. And I do find that one of that's one of the most important types of photographs uh, to have in your arsenal as either a travel photographer or a documentary photographer. It, at, at magazines frequently ask uh, for this type of photograph. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you're photographing a um, you know a sommelier, you might have them you know in the cellar 
holding a bottle of wine. And so, so this one is in Pyongyang, uh, which, uh, as we mentioned a minute ago, is the uh, capital of, of North Korea. And people are cooperative. Uh, you, you know, we see in the news, you know, what side where, 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 where the, you know, soldiers marching around and uh, Kim Il sung is, or, or, or now Kim Jong Un, you know, is uh, is watching the parade of soldiers and military equipment. Uh, but there's a there's really a daily life going on there that uh, is is missed most of the time. And I, I think, unfortunately, sometimes photographers or, or other members of the press sort of jump in there. They do they do a one time thing and they want to do an expose without really getting to know the country and and to know any subject. Uh, it takes time. And I think, you know, 10 trips, I've got a pretty good sense. And also traveling all over the country. You really need to, to understand North Korea, you really have to get out of the city because uh, not all the cities have these nice buildings in the background. Uh, that's for sure. And how does it work these days? Like, uh, you know, let's say I want to travel to North Korea. So it's a, it's a question of, of a few special permissions, you know, applications and so on. Or how, how does a tourist enter North Korea these days? Right. I'm actually not well informed. Right. Well, it, it, it's much easier for you than me. Uh, uh, there was an American uh, around 2014, uh, Otto Wumbear, uh, who was on a tour and he tried to take a, a propaganda poster. He went down to uh, a lower Florida hotel, went into a restricted area, took a poster. Now, in almost any other country, maybe you get fined, maybe they just give you a warning. Uh, that's a, a very serious thing in North Korea. Things that we might not think are a big deal, huge deal. So he ended up in captivity mm -hmm. uh, and then ended up somehow in a coma. Uh, there was negotiations. That, uh, the United States got him back and he, he died almost immediately upon returning here. And so the United States uh, stopped allowing American passport holders to travel there. Uh since you don't have an American passport, almost most other countries can travel there. Uh, and so you have a big advantage over me and, and maybe many of your viewers do as well. Uh, but right now the country is completely closed anyway. They, they, they have not come out of the COVID restrictions. Uh, when, when they do again, uh, when they do come out of that, um, uh, take advantage of your uh, non-U.S. citizenship, uh, there's a few other countries that are on that same list. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. I, well, I take that back. It's not North Korea that's that's stopping uh, me from coming in. It, it's that uh, I can't use a U.S. passport to do it, and I don't have any other passport. Um, and then I, yeah, I could try to go in uh, as a journalist and get a special exemption on my U.S. passport, but then the North Koreans wouldn't want me in there for that. In other words, it, 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 there's a it's a it, we call a catch twenty two here, mm -hmm. and so it's a very difficult situation. Maybe things will will change, uh, but for the present, uh, and so I don't want to say that project's done. You know, I've been there 10 times. I would love to go back in, uh, but right now, that's got to be on hold until something changes. And interacting, you said, with, with those people like here on this image, uh, so people are, you know, are they camera shy or they are rather, rather open? What's the reaction like when you ask them for a, for a portrait like this? Oh, no, no, they were open. And then you go into restaurants, you go anywhere. Kids love to be photographed. Uh, you know, the one thing is, you know, military installations, you know, it might be a bridge or something that they might have an issue with that I might not be aware of. But no, it's it's sort of like the old days. You know, when I was first beginning, you could really shoot even in the U.S., you know, people on the street, much easier. Now everybody's more suspicious about what are you doing? That, that That's here. You, you don't find that, as you know, you know, in... in and, and Europe's become, of course, much more restrictive too. Mm -hmm. In Asia, you know, places if you're walking on the streets in China, Vietnam, whatever, it's very easy to shoot. Uh, you know, people want they want to get in front of your camera and do things. Mm -hmm. North Korea, uh, the average person has a lot of fun with, with getting in front of them. Okay, yeah, then. yeah. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. I, I will say one thing real quickly. Uh, yeah, the, go ahead. If if they really look poor or something. Uh, they still might allow you to be photographed, but but you do on occasion get your photographs checked when you're trying to leave the country, and and they might say erase this, erase that, and so you really don't have a choice. Now, hopefully, you've backed up the, those photos anyway. But you know, if 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 the, if the people tell you to erase the photo, you got to erase the photo. Mm -hmm. That's 
working in North Korea. And it's frustrating, but that's what it is. Okay. Okay, let's switch gear kind of completely because I want to also showcase, you know, the, the exact variety of work you, sure. you produce. So, have a look. Ah, good. Well, <laughs> here's the, here's, here's the, and I, I thank you for picking this one. This, this is one of my favorite photographer portraits. And so this came out of a book called Faces of the 20th Century Master Photographers and Their Work. Uh, and it's Alfred Eisenstadt. And, and so what I did is I combined my portraits of, of these photographers that really illustrated the 20th century and then uh, five of their photographs. And then we went on to the next photographer and then the next. Uh, and so Alfred Eisenstadt, people might, people would, for the most part, people wouldn't recognize him. Uh, they might recognize in the photography field, recognize his name, but they would definitely recognize his photos. So his most famous photo is the uh, sailor kissing the nurse in Times Square at the end of World War II. So, so uh, he's, he was the most famous life photographer. And when he passed away, uh, Life magazine ran a picture in, as the final page saying the, the, the master's favorite photo of himself, which of course was a big honor. Uh, I, I used a big silver reflector. Uh, this was on his 95th birthday at the Time Life building. I used a big silver reflector to kick some light back and then lined him up with that bright spot on the building behind him. Mm. Uh, but he was an amazing photographer, loved going to work every day, even though, you know, he wasn't shooting by, by this time. He, the, the Life magazine uh, always had an office for him uh, until the day he passed away. And Mary Ellen Mark and I were together on that same day, and she didn't bring her camera. She was going, since this was his birthday, so she borrowed a, um, a, a Nikon with a 28 millimeter lens and did a great portrait of me with her and then I did a portrait of her kissing Izzy for his birthday and it was just so interesting to see her technique she did a Dutch angle in this very dull conference room it's like why yeah <laughs> that's Izzy we have a discussion coming up here on frames you know black and white versus color the, the typical yeah. you know standard uh, uh, everlasting dilemma or choice you know and for example like this particular series you you I think all of the images are in black and white right yeah the I mean I was there particular thought behind, you know, this choice? Well, I was up until my trip to North Korea in 2005, my first one, uh, I was a, a black and white photographer. I loved uh, film, the Japanese bath, 100% was a choice to go black and white because mm -hmm. it was definitely the feel for Japanese hot springs. Uh, but, but even Vietnam Project, I, I was really a black and white photographer. I loved, uh, you know, going into the dark room, doing things. Uh, uh, but for the photographer series, yeah, that started in the black and white world. And as I went into the, uh, when I switched, uh, to color because of North Korea, because I didn't want to bring a bunch of rolls of film into North Korea, I wanted to bring a digital mm -hmm. camera, mm -hmm. uh, but also I wanted just to show North Korea as accurately as I could without the filter of, of, of black and white. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so I also would want a, a Probably one of the biggest photo awards in black and white photography, and I, th I don't know if that helped make me feel like, well, maybe you know, my time here, um, you know, is done to a degree with black and white since digital's here, and a lot of assignments they wanted color. It was sort of hurting the commercial aspect of my work. Mm -hmm. I remember, yeah, you know, one client actually said, you know, we love his work. I uh, said to my agent, oh, we love his work, but you know, this whole campaign's color, and I had just been lazy about updating my. <laughs> My, okay. I, uh -huh. But but yeah, I love black and white to this day. I mean, I'm going to meet uh, Michael Kenna uh, on on Saturday in in Tokyo. And and if, for, for those viewers who don't know him, they should look up his work. He is such an amazing. Well, um, if you want to look up his work, you can oh, also you go. go to frames. Fantastic! Look at the that. very first edition. Please really? say say hello to Michael. We have met a few times or maybe twice in Switzerland. He also visits Switzerland from time to time. You know. So, uh, wow, this is amazing. You guys know each other. So oh, yeah, yeah. Well, also, and I was talking a couple of weeks ago to, St you know, Steve McCurry, and, and, and Steve actually just posted a photo from a hot spring. You probably have Steve as well in there, for sure. Let, uh, this is... Probably, we, we, well, we, we cross over on a lot of uh, probably amazingly, uh, amazing <laughs> for people. Oh, look at that. <laughs> this, is getting, this is getting interesting. Okay, go on. <laughs> well, he's He's... 
that's a fantastic cover. You have one amazing cover after another. But Steve actually is is starting to get my brain thinking a different way because last time I had talked to him, you know, he was just shooting uh, uh, more fixed lenses. All of a sudden, and, it, and and a different camera system. Now he's shooting, you know, with a Leica with a twenty four to ninety, and then he just goes okay. out one camera, a- and uh, he, you know, I have to be uh, even though I really try to stay in shape and i think i am in good shape but carrying a lot of heavy stuff on my back is not great uh but he leaves his stuff in his room and then goes out with just a 2490 and one and look, who's going to shoot better on the street than than steve mccurry okay. uh, but i mean i i wish nikon made it a fast 24 to 90 or or, or 24 to 85 or 28 to 85 and so i'm constantly you know the, these amazing photographers and, and now i probably interviewed uh maybe 600 photographers or so. And not only, you know, that, but many have become really great friends. And so, yeah, I will see Michael on, on Saturday and actually, uh, uh, a couple other photographers that you might, uh, Sam Abel, uh, I'm going to be teaching workshops in, in, in Japan and w- w- with George Nobichi, we're doing stuff. And so, so yeah, I've really been fortunate that, oh, and all, you know, that's another aspect of what I do as well. Like I just had a, a feature with Don McCullen in Vanity Fair and mm-hmm. Don is legendary. Um, yeah, yeah. We're going to rephrase what, what he's normally called, but he's a legendary anti-war photographer. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Wow. Uh, let's continue. I have so, three more. Two more images here for you. Uh, okay. Again. Yeah, you really produce such an amazing magazine. You're, you're just beautiful stuff. Well, thank you so much. I mean, you know, uh, I, I I love the idea. I mean. I was born already in the, let's say, digital, uh, uh, um, you know, era and, you know, shooting digital. Uh, but, you know, I discovered paper, you know, photographs on paper, you know, some some relatively early on. I mean, my father was still in the dark room and so on, you know. Ah. But uh, so it always spoke to me, you know, photography on paper. That's the result. I mean, it's just it's such a wonderful, you know, way. Ah. To, to consume photography, so you know magazines, books. Uh, I think it 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 will always have its place. That I hope so. Yeah, and and and, and, yeah, and people really thought the digital age would be the death knell to to magazines. But you go into like we have a big store in the United States called you know Barnes and Noble, but there's bookstores all over the world just filled with magazines, and and people do love that tangible print magazine. Yeah. yeah. And then one thing besides, you know, magazines and books are are exhibitions with prints on walls. People that's are, another, yeah, that's another, yeah, element. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. No. Okay. Let's uh, again something different. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a portrait, right? Oh, hundred percent. And and this is, um, you know, for my uh, the people of the forest uh, book, which is. Uh, yeah, this orangutan book, which which would not have happened with the help of uh, our fellow, you know, Swiss friends, uh, the Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation. Uh, I mean, th- this was shot all over the world with, with uh, orangutans in captivity. Uh, some, uh, but then I also then went to Borneo and photographed them at, at the Borneo Arrival Sur- Survival Foundation Center, where they were trying to get them. Uh, trained to go back into the wild uh, and uh but the ones that i did that were in captivity was really to show uh the, you know the connection between uh you know that we are fellow great apes i mean it, and, and there's so many different personalities every single portrait in that book shows a very different personality uh you know as i said we have you know 94 point uh, we, we share 96.4 percent of the same dna uh they're very sensitive creatures uh, the name of the book, The Way of the Japanese Bath, uh, is actually from a translation of the Malay word, uh, the people and forest. Because even way before the, the, the concept of cameras uh, was around, people recognized that, that the similarities b- between humans and, and orangutans. And, and orangutans in the wild can only be found in Sumatra and Borneo, and that's it. I mean, th- their area is shrinking and their populations are, are in a very precarious state. And obviously, you know, in, in the news, you hear about the issues between palm oil plantations and orangutan. Mm-hmm. 
uh, and we're at a critical point. Uh, but, uh, you know, this was shot where I overpowered the background because I, in certain places I could actually get in with the orangutans. You, you wouldn't want to get in uh, a, an area with, with an adult male orangutan in, in close proximity, and so, I, but I would often shoot through, through some sort of glass. But I would use a, a strobe from the side, uh, and so I would avoid reflections. Uh, and then I would be my, my lights would be so powerful that I would overwhelm the ambient light, and mm -hmm. at, and I was able to get the background to go dark. And so that's how I got almost a studio effect. And I, of course, shaped the light as well. Um, what What are you sensing? Were you sensing, and if then, what kind of you know, uh, any kind of interaction you know in between you and 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 them you know when 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 working there like what? Oh yeah. Did you did you feel they were aware of? I mean, of course they. Most probably, I don't know. I not are not aware of what's happening. That it's a photography, yeah. and, but that you are giving them more attention than you know than than than. On a usual day, someone someone would do. It. Were you oh. sensing something special there? Oh, a hundred percent. In fact, it's even more than that. Uh, one of the orangutans. I know this sounds crazy, and uh, but it's true, a hundred percent true. One of the orangutans signaled to me to turn my camera around and wanted to see his photo because they do have an awareness oh, of self. No way on the, on the on the screen. One hundred percent. And and they do a lot of at the uh, at the International Orangutan Center in Indianapolis. Uh, they do cognitive tests, and you do not want to take on an orangutan in a cognitive, uh, certain cognitive tests like recognition. They'll 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 flash a lot of things in front of them, and then they have to point where they just saw something, and they will beat us every time uh, with that particular thing. In other words, there's other areas where obviously humans will, will excel at, but there's other areas of cognitive testing that orangutans, and okay. so they need awareness. But that, that's not going to happen in in the wild. If you, you photographed an orangutan in the wild, uh, they won't have a concept that you're taking a photograph. But but in environments like this, they're much more used to people. Uh, they understand, you know, obviously people must have shown them on the back of the their viewfinder before their photo. Now, now, now this the AZ, who ended up on the cover of the book, was the one who, who signaled for me to turn it around. I showed it to him, but he didn't sign off on it. He didn't give a thumbs up or anything. So they didn't <laughs> he just sort of looked. Lost interest, but they do. Uh, are, they're aware they're being photographed. Most of the the adults, I would say, in these controlled environments. Uh, but then they'll lose interest and do something else. They don't. It, 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 yeah, it, it, it's sort of like in the life of Pi at the end. You know, you hope the the tiger turns around and says goodbye, yeah. and he just yeah. moves on his way. Because, but it's. Um, but they they have a much level higher um, awareness than we probably would normally give them you know credit what what wonderful series have is truly truly special you know and the, the way you exactly isolate them you know with this dark backgrounds and uh, it's a um yeah great great but this also ended up everything exactly in a book right uh, the book right right the, right the book the way the uh, uh the people of the forest and oh. yeah so far i have uh, nine books out and a couple of them are in three languages um but besides the book, it's it's been in exhibitions, uh, and 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 also uh, it won the uh, International Photography Awards uh, top award for for uh, Wildlife Book of the Year or Nature Book of the Year. I should say I should be accurate on on that. Uh, and, and also what what you had mentioned earlier, I should say about it you know, making a living. Uh, the North Korea book, uh, you know, maybe with some of the print sales, uh, it it it. It, and and the Vanity Fair and, and stuff through Getty Images, maybe it, it made the money back for those trips. I'm not so sure if it did, but what it did lead to uh, was an assignment to shoot the Turkey advertising campaign because the North Korea book. Um, I have two of them, but this it was this one when the 2014 uh, Book of the Year at the IPA Awards, and then because of that, uh, I got the Turkey advertising campaign. And so they hired four photographers. We each got a section of the country, and that's where our first work with Steve he, uh, McCurry. He took another section. So okay, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's how that comes together. So, and so it's a non-linear payoff. Uh, and, and so and so and as and as I said, you know, books 
people are thinking about doing books, it's, it's, it's worth the investment if you have to do it yourself, if you truly believe in a project. Because they're door openers. They're, they're the basis of exhibitions often. You know, it's always, as, as you know really well, it's always a hook. You need a hook. Why an exhibition now? What's yeah. coming up? And that's the same thing for magazines. Why now? Always have to answer that question with editors. Yeah. Okay, the people of the forest. And then we have the, the people of the Asmat. Wow, you really have been doing your uh, homework because that's, yeah, that's new. That's brand new. Tell, tell, tell us about, you know, the, the project, just briefly, you know, uh, the location and, you know, who, who the people are on those. I mean, again, amazing portraits. Thank you. Well, this is uh, West Papua, which I really didn't know much about at all. I've always been fascinated by uh, the concept of New Guinea. And, and really, I, you know, I love off the beaten track places of the world. Um And you can definitely say that West Papua is not overrun with tourists. That's for sure. And so uh, this was an expedition ship. I, I was um, doing a workshop uh, or a photo coach for Abercrombie and Canton. We were sailing from uh, Indonesia to Australia. And, and one of the stops was uh, West Papua. And uh, I was able to get access uh, uh, earlier before... Uh, the, the people that were on a ship came. And so during that more quiet time, I was able to do portraits. And so these people were former headhunters uh, not that long ago. In other words, some of the people still alive there were involved in headhunting. Wow. Uh, right. And, 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 and uh, Rockefeller, one of, I, I think it was Michael Rockefeller, one of the Rockefellers disappeared in this area in the 19th, I believe it was early 60s. I was never seen again, and, and it's believed that he was uh, eaten, uh, killed in Eden, uh, or, or he, uh, one of the headhunters. But I, I think part of that ceremony is they eat a part of their uh, victims, or victims, or, yeah, or, or their yeah, uh, you know, uh, their their adversaries. Because you know, more often it was not just people that stumbled into their village, but you know, they had wars with with mm. other tribes in the area, a and so. Um, Uh, this was there's a men's hut uh and so which is pretty dark and so i just had him i loved doing these uh environmental portraits oh, i'm sorry this is not an environmental portrait at all but these windows are the eyes to the soul that's the other type of portrait i like to do um where i do it with more uh tend to be more shallow depth of field than i would with an environmental portrait uh and but the background was the men's hut but by having him come out just to where he's almost hitting direct light but still in what what you know open shade gave a nice clean light uh and uh but you can see the the by going fairly shallowed up the field by the time you get to to the back of the shoulders it's out of focus which helps you know bring you more into the eyes and you can see that and you know once again you know like steve's uh famous afghan girl shot mm -hmm. you know and, and i think one of the keys is Uh, in professional photography, uh, it, professional photographers really have a keen awareness of f-stop and really use that tool, just like cinematographers in movies. If you look at movies, you know, uh, uh, great cinematographers use not only lighting, but, um, but their apertures, their choices are very carefully crafted to bring the viewer where you want them. And, and so for me, Uh, too much depth of field, your eye starts bouncing all over the place where shallow depth of field and eye contact really brings you right in on the subject, but also separating light and dark by bringing, you know, getting the F-stops uh, or getting the, 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 the ratio enough that the background just goes dark. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is, is often a technique I'll do. So, so my guess would be when you, when you work, when you walk around, travel, you kind of, you have your camera set to aperture priority most of the time. Yes, very good. That's that's 100 correct. But I will keep my my eye also looking at the shutter speed to mm -hmm. make sure it doesn't drop too low. Uh, nowadays for the first time and I never did this before. Uh but uh when I was shooting the Olympics, uh one of the uh, and and it was getting light dark light dark and and shooting skiing, it was on a stormy day and uh one of the other photographers said uh You know, why don't you go with auto ISO? And it was also snow. And so, you know, maybe go plus point or, or I, I did it myself at that point, uh, mm -hmm. point, 
point three plus point three point seven because obviously when there's a lot of white you're going to underexpose right and so but if you if you but then I set my shutter speed and aperture and just let my ISO float but that's only since uh, the the uh, mirrorless camera I shouldn't say digital world I did not do that with with DSLRs but with with um, mirrorless cameras and I've moved to the Z, uh, Nikon Z9 and Z8 mm-hmm. uh, for the most part I tend uh, to be more open to this uh, auto ISO where I'm to, and, and then I'm just controlling my shutter speed and, and, yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. but but yet my typical throughout my life has been aperture priority mm-hmm. really pay, and because what when you when you shoot a, a DSLR or before that an SLR or I should just say DSLR uh, in this case uh or or and just SLR, where you're always seeing your widest aperture, and you can of course push down the, you know the um, the preview button, but then it gets very dark. And mm-hmm. but if you but and but now with the mirrorless, you know pretty much what you see is what you get. Yeah. So Mark, I have the feeling you know I was thinking about the the places you visited, you know all the people you met uh, in front of your camera, you know behind your camera, you know all the photographers you met. Seems to me like the you know photography, or even a camera as a tool, you know, became this 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 thing which really uh, yeah you know helped you or, or led you to to such a such a meaningful and strong connection you know with with the world, with the planet, with other human beings, with you know making friends, uh, discovering those stories and places. Uh, is it something you kind of? Uh, envisioned this way when you were starting with photography or it started de- you know, developing into this direction and it just dragged you more and more into this wonderful circle of, like you say, occurrences, stories, you know, friendships? Yeah, d- d- definitely the latter. Definitely the latter. Uh, I loved travel even as a, as a little kid. Uh, we would do family road trips around the United States and I would keep a diary collect postcards. My dad, uh, you know, had, had an eight millimeter, uh, film camera, uh, for, for, for film, making films and, uh, uh, still cameras. I remember, you know, early on, uh, probably the earliest 35 millimeter camera that I played with was a Konica. And he was a very good photographer. He, he did, uh, public relations for, for, uh, for, uh, radio and TV. And so he took, Photos that were used professionally, uh, I wouldn't say in a, in a sense that he was a professional photographer, but he was a serious one, and his photos were used all the time in PR, or public relations, uh, for, for for KCBS, different big stations. Uh, and so I grew up around that, uh, but it was not till college when I went into a, a wet darkroom for the first time and I saw an image come up in the developer that that I just was bit by the... The photo bug. It was just the most magical thing mm-hmm. I I had ever witnessed. I was just enthralled by it, and that feeling, though I'm no longer in a, go into a wet dark room, uh, has never left me. The magic of photography, uh, and it ties in perfectly with my, you know, my degrees in history and, and documentary studies from my masters. That you know, th- this this concept that we can freeze a moment in time is still mind-boggling. And basically, you know, last year, one could say last year, 2023, uh, was the 200th anniversary of uh, photography. I mean, if, it, uh, if, if, you, if you feel that uh, Joseph Mies, you know, uh, invented it, I mean, people in England might say, well, you know, you got to give Talbot some more credit, which, of course, he was amazing and, and helped the nigga. Yeah. People argue you forever about... Yeah, exactly. But, but, but basically, I think everybody would yeah. agree... That yeah. basically photography is about 200 years old. Yeah. And, and then, you know, maybe officially 1839 with, with uh, Daguerre, it, it got much more functional around the world. But, but it's really only been as we move toward the 20th century that we started to get shutter speeds uh, or film sensitivities fast enough to really record the world in real time. And so it's still fairly new, I think, in a human psyche, uh, this concept of 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 freezing reality now unfortunately you know with ai you can you can create a virtual reality and that that can be dangerous i'm not saying all ai is bad at all but but uh 
we we have such a great visual picture of the 20th century because of all these amazing photography uh, photographers. And also we can look into the 19th century. I mean, yeah, Felix Bieto, you know, showing us things. Uh, people can say, oh, he staged this, he exhumed bodies in India or whatever. But, you know, that things were done differently then, but we still get a very clear picture of what mm. light was like then. Uh, Do and- you ever photograph with a phone? Oh, sure. Uh, you know, if, if I'm, uh, especially, you know, for travel stories, I will, um, you know, take some food shots if it's, you know, travel related to be, because uh, it, it's high enough resolution with the iPhone. You know, for that, and I think the iPhone is fantastic for panoramas, uh, but uh, any, and actually I've had London Sunday Times travel magazine. I did a better shot of uh, the Hollywood sign, special mission permission to get up close and I did a panorama which turned out better I didn't have the I, I wasn't didn't have anything wide enough to really do it from that close range panorama did a great job but I I can't envision myself uh ever just becoming a, um, an iPhone photographer because the lenses how, how do you compete you know I'll be photographing the 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 uh, Olympics in Paris and I and I have a, a Nikkor 400 2.8 how, how do you how do you compete with, with that little lens on the iPhone, even though I think they're great for portraits and I think, you know, the portrait mode's great and all that. And that's great if you're doing stuff online, you know, or making small prints. Uh, because it's still about seeing. That's still the most important thing. But uh, yeah. but but they can't take on the Olympics, uh, you know, or, or any board or any or wildlife from a distance, as, you know. One last photograph, uh, you know, from the from the yeah kind of s- sad place after what happened in japan oh yeah uh, yeah so tell me you know so did you travel extra you know after it happened to japan or where you happened to be there or in the area or in japan at that time and uh, how did it how did it come about about you know doing this project right and 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 this is now uh, a, a current exhibition in, in tokyo uh, of 25 large prints, it, it's, it, I called it, um, well, actually that name changed for the, uh, gave it more of a Japanese name, but basically they call uh, what happened uh, San Ten Ichi Ichi 311. It, it, you know, but it was a great Tohoku earthquake. Uh, I was in Canada at the time and I actually got it, my dad was still alive and he um, uh, sent an email saying, hey, turn on the news. And then I see these waves coming in to uh, Sendai and then continuing on in Sendai area, not actually Sendai, but Sendai area, and continuing on to up to six miles. It was just, it was just the most unbelievable footage I had ever seen. And so I had to finish the project in Canada, and then, and then I very quickly had to do something in China uh, with Art Wolf, and then uh, right away, then. Uh, went to Japan and and it was difficult to work because there was no public transportation to the area. So I asked a, a, a colleague, uh, Yoshi o- o- Okuma, in Tokyo, if he was willing to drive up with me to Tohoku, and and uh, and we did. Uh, and so my most well known shot from that area is a boat, uh, a large boat in Otsuchi that's stranded on top. But if people see my website, they can. Um, they, yeah, they, they, we will show it up for you. Oh, good. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, this yeah, this one. one. Yeah, this one right here. Um, right. And so that's... What, a, how was your experience when you saw those things up up close? I mean, what, what you know, what emotion... Oh. How, how do you approach such situations? Because you have been in those, yeah, like places like this one or, or other places where, where, you know, bad things happened. For right. Whatever. How do you, um, how do you, you know deal with your own emotions and, you know, emotional reactions to, to those horrible, you know, scenes? Well, they're, they're, they're very different depending on where it is. Uh, you, you know, it, it, if it's, if it, and I haven't been in many conflict zones, uh, you know, most recently, you know, twice into Ukraine. Uh, but, you know, if you're near the battle lines, you know, there's, there's hatred, you know, back and forth between sides. Uh, and so those are much tougher, and there's so much suffering. Uh, now, of course, there's a lot of suffering 
of course, almost 20,000 people died in, in uh, Tohoku, not so much from the earthquake at all, but from, from the tsunami. Just horrible stories about grandmothers going down to try to get the kids out of school and what, you know, they went from a safe place down. The kids had already been evacuated uh, up to a higher place, but the grandmother, you know, a lower point and, and, and washed away. I met countless victims and I saw, you know, some, some very sad things, but everybody was on the same side and trying to help each other. And so you feel in that situation much different uh, than when, when, you know, shells are coming in. Uh, and so, um, yeah, very, but it's just overwhelming. And, and my friend, uh, my, my friend Yoshi summed it up better than I could. And, and I wouldn't dare. Uh, anyway, we were standing on a bridge looking out at just endless devastation. And he said, and since he's Japanese, you know, that's why I'm saying I felt much better that he said it. He said, this is what Hiroshima must have looked like. And yet this was 3D in color, where mm-hmm. when we look at you know, photos of uh, Hiroshima, in fact, my, my all-time, what, what I think is the most powerful image out of uh, Hirosh- Hiroshima is actually Alfred Eisenstadt's shot uh, 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 of a mother and child in a rubble of Hiroshima half a year after the war. It is one of the greatest uh, environmental portraits of all time. But yeah, here are cadaver dogs uh, looking for, for bodies there. But once again, everybody's on the same side trying to help. A lot of volunteers there. And then when we came back, we come back to the shot that you, you brought out. Uh, this is a very sad story because this was an evacuation, uh, a school that, that was designated as an evacuation area. And so people were in the first and second floors of this school after the, the earthquake. They thought it was far enough away from the beach uh, that they would be safe, but the water came in, and you can actually see the water line, uh, where and, and it killed a number of people in this in this classroom. Uh, and um, you know, to be in a place where just such horror happened, of course, is 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 is, is, is terrible because it could be. I, I don't think you even have to relate to like, oh, this could, could have been my family or whatever. You know, Elliot Irwood, who, who, who we lost last year, when said that, that life uh, is not just about the extremes, you know, of, of war at, at, or, or you know, the highs and lows of, 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 of our existence, of the human condition. It's everything in between. And he was so good at capturing those more subtle moments. Mm-hmm. Uh, those tend not to, you know, win the world press photos, you know, photos of the year. Uh, but they're just as important or maybe more important because that really represents the 99%, 99.9% of the time when people are just going about their daily lives. Mm. And so that I definitely, uh, even in places like North Korea, Iran, which was another book, um, Wonderlust. Uh, you can see that that's really where a lot of the the focus is, but but we also at the same time can't ignore uh, what's happening around the world. And so I think maybe Japan, because I do love so much, maybe that's you know shows maybe the most balance where uh, uh, my approach, where I've got um, daily life, I've got the Olympics, which is a, a which is a high. Uh, but also then documenting, um, you know, that some people were against, you know, those Olympics happening during COVID and the concerns about that. I didn't turn a blind eye to that. Um, but then you've got the, you know, unfortunately, in California, where I am, shares this as well. We, we live on the ring of fire. And we just saw in Wajima, uh, in the Noto Peninsula, where, where I happened to be shooting a commercial project a couple of years ago, t- 2000, well, more than a couple of years, but 2018. The exact same places uh, where I had been are now mm-hmm. gone. Uh, uh, but but so I think it's a, it, it's my work is sort of a balancing act to try to show uh, aspects of, of our existence here. Mm-hmm. Maybe I don't know if that's overstating it or not. But no, and you know I, I remember you mentioning in in some other conversation, um, you know, projects less like yours. You know the the. The travels, the the effort that goes into those projects, 
it requires so much energy and so much kind of perseverance and patience you know and you i remember you mentioning exactly you just mentioned your dad before a couple yep. of minutes ago who, who passed away a couple of years ago right that you got it from him because oh, yeah. he he fought with this disease which you know, about oh, yeah. he lived so long so he amazing it long. was not an excuse for him he just lived his life oh, to the very end and i feel it in you with all this i mean this is so much effort and you know pursuing your vision and your the project which you want to really you know uh, uh, finish it it requires much strength yeah so, so for those you know of our viewers listening who maybe are, are working on their visions or their dreams photographic dreams projects you know and kind of and kind of um don't find solutions or maybe energy mm. to, to pursue those visions what, what what would you say what's this day by day kind what are you telling yourself day by day you know why are you doing it and what's the where's the energy coming from well i i, I try not to uh think too much you know in bruce lee i happen to you know love martial arts and do it and um it, it, even though this was in a movie into the dragon he said don't think feel and so i think i'm very driven by this neanderthal cro magnon uh, approach to things i think that the mm -hmm. brain sometimes can get you in a bit, bit of trouble uh but when you're when you're pursuing something first of all i i would say but annie Leibowitz said this to me she you know Go within, you know. Go into your own backyard before you go out somewhere, and I think that, and I think that's so well said. Eve Arnold talked about that when she did in China. You know, to, she was looking for a long-term project to do something that evened out all the unevenness of uh, a freelance life. Uh, you know, either you're overwhelmed with work or you're waiting for the phone to ring. Um, but for sure, I would say. Follow something that you feel deeply committed to. And, and sometimes it's like, okay, you start going one direction, you might go into a place uh, going one direction, and then it takes you a completely different path. And so you've got to be open to that. That, that, that happened in Ukraine. Uh, I didn't initially go in to, to do something during a war on, on people that were rescuing animals. I had a, a, a different idea. Uh, and then you also have to be ready to respond to the, the Japanese tsunami. I had no idea, of course, that that was going to happen. Um, and so sometimes you have to move quickly. And then what happened to that one, it became a, a, a multi, multi, multi-year uh, project uh, where I uh, started then documenting the recovery efforts. And that's what mm -hmm. part, part of this uh, mm -hmm. exhibition is. And so I would say run with it for a while and also don't be afraid of picking up a pen. I, I would say that that what's what's really helped me a lot is I, I in the beginning, uh, and not even so much even at the beginning. This went on for a while. I was always you know begging writers, hey, let's go do this, let's go do that. And it was actually my mother uh, who who wrote, uh, as did my dad as well. Uh, not, my mom was a teacher, but she also in her earlier years worked, uh, you know, for NBC and wrote. Uh, but she said. Uh, she said, oh, just illustrate, write it yourself. And so I did the first time uh, about a, a story. And then she said, uh, and it wasn't very good at all. And she said, just tell me about it. And I told her about the project. And she goes, okay, write that. And that was such great advice. because, And since I do have depth from my studies in history, mm -hmm. that's really where I've gone. And so my, my, I'm able to marry the the written word and photographs and go out on my own and do stuff and not be dependent on a writer. Though I, I still, there's nothing better like when I was in Iraq with Tim Nelville, amazing writer, uh, the project in North Korea with Pico Iyer, uh, Drex Hykus for the Los Angeles Times in China. That's still the ideal. But to, to team up with an amazing writer who, and the words roll trippingly off the tongue or off their pen, uh, is, is is still the ideal, but I'm not afraid to get out on my own and pursue something mm -hmm. and, and illustrate it with my own words. And and so my advice would be uh, at least just write out. Uh, and now we have you know things like blurb, where you can uh, just do a one-off book, uh, put together uh, a, a one-off book, uh, see how it looks, uh, get rid of the mistakes uh, at that time. You know, clarify your vision you know, for, 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 for $50 rather than, uh, you know, going 
too deep into something and say, wow, I'm really missing this or really missing that. And um, you can also then submit those to uh, galleries, uh, book dummy awards, and you never know where it's going to go. But uh, but there is sometimes a time to really recognize that something's not working. A and uh, but usually, when, you know, one door closes, another opens. Uh, but if you're just fatigued, like what you were saying, uh, maybe you really have to ask yourself, why are you feeling that way? Is it not working? Uh, and um, you know, maybe show it to some other photographers and, and, and see what what they think people that you really respect you show everybody everything and you'll never get anywhere but um yeah. somebody that you respect their 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 vision you know that you get feedback from. and and how important do you think it's uh, looking at other photographers work well i've really been spoiled because my my teachers have been the, the greatest photographers of all time because not only because of you know my study of history but also getting to know these people and having conversations with them. And I, I learn all the time. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm not, uh, that doesn't mean I'm copying anybody, but but I, I have an awareness of approach. I'm not reinventing the wheel. I get inspiration, uh, but I also look at art. Uh, and, and many, many photographers all the time uh, uh, just, uh, you know, say, boy, I was really inspired by, you know, so and so. Uh, that that's 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 a, a constant. Um, in fact, I was just speaking the other day with somebody, and, and they were oh Don McCullen, uh, and, and he was saying, uh, and and please help me with the pronunciation, Yosef Sudak. Yosef Sudak, yeah. Uh -huh. Am I saying it pretty pretty? Well? I guess so. Sudak, yeah. There you go. Well, yeah, exactly. Poland, so it's just over the border. Sudek. Right. No, no. I know you're more within the range. So, so, so. But yeah. So my pronunciation. But, but he was so inspired by him. But and his work was very different. But I, I mean, then I learned a lot because he had said, you know, he had lost. Uh, Sudek had lost an arm in World War One. I. I was not aware of that mm -hmm. at all. An artillery shell. In fact, Al Eisenstein, Izzy, told me when we were uh, together and we became uh, friends. Whenever I went to New York, we hung out and I flew up and met him in San Francisco. But he was shot through the leg. He was a German a soldier during World War One, and then he had to escape. And when the Nazis came in, and then that's how he ended up in light. Um, and so, but so they're all my teachers. I think it's vital to be aware, and and, and it's an endless source of inspiration for sure. Oh. Tell me who who I should invite next here to talk talk with about photography. One one. I think I. I well, there's so many amazing photographers. I, I would suggest somebody that, that your audience uh, outside of the U.S. might not be as familiar with, but who I think is one of the greatest portraitists of all time, and I would say Sandro Miller. Okay. At his email is Sandro underscore film. Does a lot of stuff with John Malkovich, did a whole series where he uh, recreated uh, the portraits using John of, of the greatest portraitists uh, of all time. Uh, and it did it in such an unbelievable way. And we often teach workshops together as okay, well. Wonderful. I, I will reach out. Yeah, and I can, I'll, I'll connect you to if you'd like. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Maybe, maybe send me a note if you want, and then I'll, I'll, I'll send it on. Yeah, thank you so much. Mark, yeah. has been a pleasure. Wonderful. Yeah, I mean, so many insights, so many yeah, stories. Uh, I have been a fan of you know, your, your work for. Exactly. It's, I think, I guess it's 12 years. First edition of, of the Japanese bus, which exactly. we, we, 2003. So 20 uh, so years. 20 years. No, okay. I got the book a bit later, but, uh, yeah, since then I have been, you know, I have been scouting and, <laughs> yeah, I know. It. and now I'm on, yeah, we're, we're pretty much out of, uh, there's 6,000 books out there. We're, we're pretty much out. We're getting close to being out of the third edition. Um, yeah. Sure, at some point it'll be a fourth edition. Um, yeah, there, there, there's definitely a reason for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. Keep. In Japan, are you are you photographing? No, oh, always, always. Uh, yeah. and, and, and anything to, particular you you are you are about to visit? So you know this time. Well, I want to do. Um, I'm going there to do some scouting for another workshop, uh, and and also for the exhibition. Uh, but at the same time, I'm going to uh, sneak out and, and photograph. Uh, 
a couple of onsen or at least one. I, I then have to run up to uh, run over to um, Taiwan, which ironically enough, they want me to come there because of this, the work I did with onsen or hot springs in Japan. They want me to visit some of theirs, and so that's how that worked out. Okay. Uh, and so I don't have a lot of time in Tokyo this, or I'm sorry, in Japan this time, but uh, I, I have to, to, to be in Japan without at least one, you know, uh, a couple of dips in the onsen would, would be. Yeah, yeah. They, they helps you, right? Work, workouts plus, plus, the, plus the dips in the onsen. Got to do both. <laughs> Got to do both. Uh, and, All right. And, yeah. yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, we stay in touch and uh, oh, yeah, I hope. Everyone, you enjoyed it, this 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 conversation. I, I loved it, Thomas, and it, it's an honor. And I congratulate you on, on doing such an amazing magazine as well. Thank Just, you so much. Yeah, yeah. One day we will have you also in in, in here. Whenever you want, I'm ready for sure. Okay, thank you so much, Michael. Cool. Right. Right. See you later.